Hello friends, it's Kayla. I'm so very excited for this vlog. So recently I put out a video where I went through all of my four and a half and five star reads and checked the authors that had blurbed them, the authors that endorsed these books, the authors whom I agree with, the books were fantastic. From there, I knew that there was a video concept like in the works. Uh, so I posted a video to my channel members and they helped me figure out what the concept was. What I did in the video is I went through every single book that fits into this like speculative horror, sci-fi, surrealist category that I do consider my favorite thing to read. And I checked if any of the authors from the spreadsheet that I created of who blurbed my favorite books, if any of them also had blurbed any of these books. Oh gosh, this was blurbed by Alexi Harrow, Emily Henry, Chloe Gong, Yang Zi Chu, James Chambers, James Morrow, Cassandra Ka. That's a lot of authors who were on my spreadsheet. Paul Tremblay. <gasps> I guess we do have to go to the TBR closet. Who liked Devil House? Nobody. We've also got Katrina Ward, Stephen Graham Jones, Josh Mallerman, Catherine and Valenti, Chuck Wendig. I do have a couple books out from the library. Hannah Witten. There's now three concepts. I'm just gonna post this video and make you figure it out. So good luck. Via my members feedback, it seems as though this is now a blurb series. So episode one is going to be the authors who blurbed the most amount of things. I am finding them blurbing other things. Episode two, maybe to come a couple months from now, is going to be actually reading from those authors. So the ones that blurbed the books, maybe they also have similar books. Maybe they also have novels that I could appreciate. So I'm going to read from the authors that I haven't read from yet. The first thing we need to do is update the spreadsheet. This was a couple months ago now and gratefully I have read more five stars. So with Paul Tremblay blurbing Our Share of Night, Genevieve Gornacek blurbing Kaikei, and Alexi Harrow and Hannah Witten blurbing Half a Soul, they have all moved into the top tier of authors who have blurbed the most amount of books that I have loved. Basically this purple tone gets deeper and richer the more that they have blurbed. So now Paul Tremblay has blurbed five, Genevieve Gornacek has blurbed five, and Stephen Graham Jones, Hannah Witten, and Alexi Harrow have blurbed four. And I guess now I've committed to updating this spreadsheet like every single month as I read new favorites. But the goal today is all five of these authors, I need to read another book that they have suggested, that they've endorsed, that they've promoted, that their name is on. First up, we've got a twofer. This has really just a plethora of authors on the back, uh, but Paul Tremblay is right at the top. Soon after follows Stephen Graham Jones right there. We also have Katrina Warren, Josh Mallerman, Catherine M. Valenti, Chuck Wendake, Shauna McGuire, Al Mikatsu, and Stephen King right on the front. This is Road of Bones by Christopher Golden. It will be my first Christopher Golden. And with this stacked list of authors, the reviews that have come in have all actually not been that great. Uh, so I'm excited to see if I agree with the authors or with the audience. Next up, just because they're on my TBR and I really want to read them soon, I also have another Paul Tremblay and Stephen Graham Jones endorsed book. So this is Bad Cree by Jessica Johns. I'll read all the blurbs to you later, but Paul Tremblay can be seen on the back right there. That was an arc sent to me that I haven't gotten around to yet. And then Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Keist has a Stephen Graham Jones quote right on the front. Moving on, my Alex E. Harrow pick was a book already in my seasonal TBR, so that works out perfectly. It's The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chokshi. I feel like we've got some horror, we've got some dark fairy tale vibes, and this all feels very good. For Hannah Witten, I actually had this out from the library, and I was gonna return it because I didn't get around to it. It wasn't in my seasonal TBR, but I had reserved it a while ago. It just came in. And I realized that Hannah Witten is right at the bottom here. It's called The World Gives Way by Marissa Levian and I think it's sci-fi, I don't totally remember. <laughs> and lastly for Genevieve Gornacek, I don't have it yet, I just reserved it from the library, but it is an Ava Reed. So of these books, I haven't read from any of these authors before, they're all new to me, but I have read an Ava Reed before, I didn't love it. But I know so many people love The Wolf and the Woodsman and Genevieve and I have such similar taste, it seems. I'm gonna see if I can trust her. So that's my six book TBR for the week. I'm really excited to get into all of these, see how they go. As far as the the authors who blurbed them, the Paul Tremblay, the Alexi Harrow, I have read from three of those five authors already. So I already know that I agree with Paul Tremblay and Stephen Graham Jones's endorsements, but I also enjoy their books. Alexi Harrow, I agree with her opinions 
so far. Um, I haven't enjoyed a book from her. And then Hannah Witten and Genevieve Gornacek are authors that I can definitely check out in episode two. But for now we're gonna focus on the books that they have blurbed. This stack just looks so good to me. I haven't been this excited about a TBR, probably because most of them have come from my TBR shelf in a while. Like I'm hoping these are all just incredible wins. I will check in with you as soon as I start the first one. Hello and welcome to my kitchen office. Yesterday I spent the first of the month filming an entire video, like sun up to sundown. So today is my official beginning of May and I need to do all of the beginning of the month things. I have a lot of tasks to do today. First thing we need to do is flip the calendars. April was about bananas. May is fruit stickers. I've got my weekly planner that I live by. I need to do a library pick up and drop off because I just filmed my wrap up. So I need to give the books back that I've had for a while. I need to make uh, the Goodreads discussion post for the Literally Dead Book Club so people can talk about Whisper Down the Lane as they read it. I need to purchase some books for the book club co-hosts. I need to plan some live show dates. Um, I also need to design and post to my channel members what we're up to this month. So I usually have a couple events going on like reading sprints. We have a little book club happening. There's also always a bonus video and I think I'm actually going to do a spinoff with this one, just a casual one where I talk about who has blurbed my least favorite books. That's not going to lead to any other video, I don't think, unless I really want to test the authors who've liked my like hated books. But I think it'll just be interesting to have their own kind of side spreadsheet. Oh, and then Rob and I are going on a trip to Vancouver this weekend. So I need to pull the luggage out of the closet. And um, I know that all of my bags are stuffed with like my winter clothing. So I think I might actually go through it all and have a pile to donate. Throughout the day, while I'm doing all of these little things, I'm gonna be reading the Last Tale of the Flower Bread. I did read the first chapter of it in this video and I gave it, I think a 10 out of 10 for initial intrigue. But I'm definitely gonna reread the first chapter now. Actually, I have the audiobook because Libro FM had it as part of the, their ALC program, which is like early audio copies. So I'll be sure to give you a review of the audiobook at the end of the day as well. At the end of the day, am I planning to finish this in one day? I guess. Why do I feel like I'm on one of those late night, like shopping network shows? It's like, here's my luggage. Here's another piece of fine luggage. So I realized I have three bags because this one is humongous. It's Liam's old hockey bag. And I thought I would donate it. So empty out all three of them, figure out what I don't want and what I want and all the stuff I don't want could go in here. I don't think I even pulled this out last fall because I have owned these for a couple years and I definitely did not wear them last year. This is going very well. I started from the beginning. The audiobook is fantastic. I've only heard one narrator so far and I'm assuming we're gonna get more than one because each chapter starts with the bridegroom as if like as in that's kind of narrating the chapter. But I'm like seven chapters in and they've all started with the bridegroom and I'm waiting for someone else to come in. So we've got this man, he meets up with Indigo and he immediately falls in love with her and her whole thing is don't ask me about my past and we can stay married and in love. Their relationship happened very quickly. Like first chapter they just met and the second chapter they were like talking about being together forever. But she referenced um, the myth of Psyche and Eros. He goes, in the tales, the moment Psyche glimpsed Eros in his true form, he left her. But that was what made the tale worth telling, that there was a light to be found in the dark. So it's like, she's telling him not to do stuff, but he obviously wants to, because he thinks something good will come out of it. Not keeping that. I don't think I ever really liked this. Most of this stuff was thrifted to begin with anyway, so it's like I don't feel bad about ditching it. I loved this little cropped jacket. I wore this to a couple concerts. Is this what I should wear to this weekend's concert? Oh, my little bird cardigan. That's a toss. Beige lightweight cardigan. A navy lightweight cardigan. A gray lightweight cardigan. A navy heavier knit cardigan, a brown heavier knit cardigan, a gray heavier knit cardigan. <laughs> I'm so versatile. There is something happening, like there's this weird realm. Our main character grew up with a brother, but his mother is like, no, you never had a brother. So he thinks he went into this like weird realm. And now I think Indigo has been taken into the weird realm. 
update. I'm over halfway now. We have gotten other perspectives, um, or one in particular. It hasn't been Indigo, but I don't want to spoil anything, and I also don't know if there's going to be chapters from Indigo. I just know that I'm loving it, and we're in a couple different timelines, and the thing that's interesting about this type of story where there's someone becoming involved with a lot of times it's like a creature a paranormal entity a god like something like that the question of the book is like is this relationship is this the only person who can see this like evil creature for who they really are which is kind and caring and misunderstood or is this evil creature did it bring the nice partner into the relationship under the guise of being this kind, compassionate, nice, like I'm actually a good person, creature, siren behavior, pull them in and then you find out they are in fact evil. I don't know that when you start this book, you know which way the story is. And at this point, I feel like there are questions regarding that. I love the writing, like this quote that was about marriage and um, rings, Indigo was twisting her ring saying uh, a circle is a fixed infinity. Even the way it looks when it's held up to the light is curious as if it's a portal to some place of mystery and your choice to wear it means you've allowed your marriage to be a threshold to the unknown. And yet even in the unknown there is a demand of mutual trust. So throughout the book, we're getting different people's perspectives on Indigo. Like that's the point of the story. And I just think it's so good. I'm now at the library and I'm gonna give all these books back and this is gonna be just as full when I get back. Okay, I was right. Do you wanna see my goodies? The Wolf and the Woodsman is here. Uh, it's thicker than I thought it would be, about 400 pages. Then we've got, oh wait, I didn't mean to get this. I also got Feed Them Silence, which is smaller than I thought. And then this one, The Witch and the Tsar, was actually my backup that I planned for a Genevieve Gornichuk and Hannah Witten blurbed story. And then Chlorine by Jade Song came in, which I don't know when I would find time to read in my TBR right now. They came in, so I have it. Before I get into my review and rating, let's see what Alexi Harrow said on the back. A fairy tale in the oldest and truest sense, a haunting dream full of blood and love, vicious truths and beautiful lies. It swallowed me whole and I went willingly. <laughs> I think that author being the blurber for this totally checks out vibe wise. The other things that I have read that she blurbed are like The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue and The Hacienda, The Midnight Bargain and Half a Soul. I wouldn't say if you loved The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, you will definitely love The Last Tale of the Flower Ride. But I think the mix of reality and magic in all of these are a pretty consistent mix, as well as actually um, The 10,000 Doors of January. Who I would actually recommend this most for is readers who love this kind of vibe where you get to question, is the magic real or not? Magical realism, surrealism, where characters go into other worlds or have powers and you're like, is this real or is it in their mind? Of course, someone started weed whacking at just the most inopportune time. Um, so this, I just feel like might come across like it's super fantastical, like mythology that is very clear and thoroughly described and like that is the focus of the story, but it's not. It's mostly real world and it's a lot about like toxic relationships. It talked about power imbalance, it talked about friendship groups, uh, toxic friendship. There was a uh, discussion and a storyline featuring a young girl being preyed upon by a parental figure. So a lot of real world stuff, but with the backdrop of this like flower bride, this mythological maybe creature and the relationships that she has had throughout her life. There's also this gothic-y haunted house feeling entity that could have become its own character but didn't quite go there. Indigo and the bridegroom end up going back to the house that she was raised in to be with her aunt who's dying and that's how the bridegroom comes to learn about Indigo's past. I'm still a little bit on the fence about my rating because I loved the prose, I loved the vagueness of it, like that is definitely my thing. I liked the things we were focused on. It was like this girl who people were just drawn to and she believed in this magical world and convinced other girls that they could be a part of it. I would recommend this one for people who love 
vibes, low plot stories. And like books that explore the themes that I discussed without going too like heavy, deeply magical and fantastical. I feel confident in my four, it could have been a five. You know what I just remembered? My spreadsheet was four and five stars because I wanted a large amount of books to be able to put on there. So I grabbed like 60. So technically with The Last Tale of the Flower Bride being four stars, it's on the spreadsheet. All of these authors are going on the spreadsheet, which means Alex E. Harrow is moving up a spot. Shannon Chakraborty is moving from this column into this column. We're gonna add Chloe Gong and Emily Henry to the spreadsheet. I'll put them in their right place later. It's not technically alphabetized, but it's vaguely alphabetized. Yangtze Chu, Sulin Tan is getting added. San Jenna, Sathian. Oh, and V.E. Schwab right on the front, moving from the second column to the first column. But that's the update. We're moving on today to Bad Creek. Our road trip to Vancouver is quickly approaching. So this being set in Vancouver will be interesting. Now this one, I remember the first chapter follows this woman, a Cree millennial named Mackenzie. And she is having these dreams that seem really real. She can take things out of her dreams. So it gave me the vibes of everybody sees the ants and the dream thieves, but I'm a couple more chapters in now and she can also bring things from the living world into her dreams. And the question she's having is, are these visions, dreams, or memories? We know that her sister is dead and I'm not sure if the question, if there's a mystery involved of how that happened, um, but I know that she goes to Alberta back to her small town, meets up with her family, and they try to solve this all together. It's interesting how both of the first books that I am reading for this video are a little bit of a different tone than I expect or that they feel like they're going to be. This is in the horror category. It's horror for sure, like I see it. Um, I'm three quarters of the way through and it's just now, it's got like a slow build to the horror. And so far it's felt like a supernatural mystery. There's a lot of family dynamics in here. I feel like I would read from Jessica Johns in another capacity. Like I would even read just general fiction from her because I think the way she explores family dynamics mixed with her actual writing style itself, beautiful sentences, the way that she's building these relationships and also highlighting this internal struggle of our main character, Mackenzie. It all feels really carefully handled and intentional. I think um, her struggling with opening up to her family and being vulnerable is relatable. She is dealing with these dreams. She doesn't know if they're real and she doesn't want to burden other people with this. She also doesn't know if her sister is contacting her from the dead because she's getting these weird messages. And there's this great slow realization that happened in a lot of grief centric books where the main character realizes they are going through the same thing as so many other people. And if they connect, they'll find that the other people feel the exact same way, even though they're not verbalizing it either. I am finding it quite slow and repetitive. There's a lot of dream sequences and then discussing the dreams after the dream sequences. It's been happening a lot. And I don't know if the author knew what she wanted to do with that. Because in another book with so many family dynamics to explore, there would be conflict. And I think it's great that she's intentionally staying away from that. The family is warm. They are distant, but they are warm. And you could create so much conflict with these characters, get into fights, have disagreements about what to do about finding her sister or finding out what happened to her sister and engaging with these supernatural entities that everybody is like acknowledging are part of the world they live in. So I do appreciate they're not there's not unnecessary drama thrown in here between her and her siblings and her aunties. And it is a short book, like this is under 300 pages. I'm 200 pages in, so it's not like I feel like I've been reading it forever, but I just find that the last 100 pages, nothing really got accomplished that didn't get accomplished in the first dream sequence. So maybe this could have been more of a novella, but now there is a plan in place to do with this supernatural situation. And I think, the action is here. So I'll let you know my rating at the end. So what Paul Tremblay said about this one is it's a compelling novel that is a mystery and a horror story about grief, but one with defiant hope in its beating heart. 
I feel like, yeah, that sums it up. This is one of those blurbs that I talked about in the blurb video that doesn't really feel like an endorsement. I want to hear the words like, I couldn't put this down. I loved this rather than just a description of the vibes personally, because I care more about, I think the author endorsing it than the author describing it accurately because obviously in this situation I'm looking for authors that I have something in common with. Does it align with the other horror books that he has blurbed that I agree with were great? I do think the vibes totally align especially if we're looking at the thing between us because I know other people have said this is a little slow it takes a while for things to happen. I love that about this one. This one wasn't didn't quite take me there. I'm gonna land on a 3.5. What I do think is great about Paul Tremblay's um, blurbs that I've seen is the books I can always expect to be multifaceted. They're not just like, hey, look at this scary thing. There's always some type of conversation going on a lot about grief and survival in more than just surviving the scary circumstance. I would say if you like some other water based, slower real life meets horror, um, like they Drown Our Daughters by Katrina Monroe, or The Drowned Kind by Jennifer McMahon. Both of these I gave three stars and I feel like they're kind of good comps for each other. And Out of Body and the Dreaminess of It by Jeffrey Ford that I gave two or three stars. Those are some books that I would say are in a similar lane to Bad Cree. It's not that I always want an explanation behind the supernatural things or how they work, but when you do start to explain some of them and then it doesn't fully get explained or some things don't check out, it loses me a little bit. Since she's having these consistent dreams and these consistent interactions, you come to understand like when and why they occur, how the supernatural element comes into the story when she's in like certain environments or certain things are present. But then in other situations where you like it, it can't enter the certain area. It's like, but why? Why is it when she's in this place or this is happening, everything's not the same? So I lacked a little bit of clarity and consistency with that element, which isn't something that I'm always looking for, but some things just didn't really make sense to me. I wanted to understand it further because it was giving me reasons for things, but then not everything. I just read the description here and it says, Bad Cree was based on her short story Bad Cree that won the 2020 Writers Trust of Canada Journey Prize. The fact that this started as a short story and I said I would like to read the short story is so interesting. Anyway, Paul Tremblay stays where he belongs on the spreadsheet for now. been on the road for four hours and I haven't well I read the first chapter of Road of Bones before we got on the road and then I was gonna listen to some of the audiobook because Rob is like a professional car sleeper say hello hello I'm a professional um, but instead I was listening to Dermot Kennedy the entire drive and then um, I was crying I was just like in my feels if he plays innocence and sadness oh that, that's, yeah, that's another one I like to tonight so. um, I will be bawling. So the first chapter of this, I really did not like the vibe of um, it starting with a car accident because he's driving down this highway and then he falls asleep at the wheel and crashes into like the, what's it called? Guard rail. Um, and there's another guy with him. So we have these two main characters and they're in Siberia and it's like frozen, everything's cold. You can't even like turn off your vehicle for a minute because it'll freeze up and won't be able to start again. So when he crashed, he got out, turned off the truck and then his um, passenger flipped out at him on the side of the road and they were like gonna freeze to death. So that's how the whole thing kicked off and then they went to this service station and they're supposed to meet somebody in there who is giving them a tour of the area. And I think they're doing like a documentary or something. It's known as the Road of Bones because um, former Soviet Union gulag prisoners have died there and they're like literally driving on a road of bones essentially. It's the coldest place on earth and there's a lot of ghost stories. So I'm assuming that the horror involved here is um, these dead workers who have been treated so poorly haunting the space and not wanting people to come and exploit the area. So 
that's what's happening. And I'll probably read it a little bit today and tomorrow while we're in Vancouver. We're also doing a stop at Ikea. This is, I think, the first time we've come to Vancouver without Liam since he was like a baby. Yeah. So we have space in the back to buy some furniture. Okay, welcome to our hotel room. This is it. Um, ridiculously expensive <laughs> because we're basically in the parking lot of uh, Rogers Arena, which is where the concert is. I didn't want to have to worry about driving in downtown Vancouver on like a Saturday night. So instead, I got a hotel room that we could just walk for like a couple minutes. And I'm happy with my idea, though the lighting, horrific. <laughs> Probably not gonna read any of my books, so I'll just check in with you, I don't know, with a couple clips from the concert of me going like this and like this. Okay, I did end up reading a third of Road of Bones yesterday. I didn't update you because I was at the concert. Um, I think the only clips I took was getting or like my outfit <laughs> before I went. And then a quick clip in the elevator um, after a couple margaritas. So that explains why I didn't update you when we got back last night. Um, I did get merch, which I wasn't planning on, but it was this beautiful lavender. And I also got a tote bag, so that's fun. And I don't know if I'm really liking this. I, like I said, I'm a third of the way in. These two men are traveling around, getting to know the area. Um, they meet this woman and then they find this young child and they're trying to figure out like where everyone in the town went because they went into the village and every single house is empty. And in a way that seems like everyone fled. So like dinners are still on the table, like people just vanished. So now they're kind of solving this mystery, but it's more so, so I just realized I forgot to put on lipstick, but I have a lip liner on. If I looked weird, nobody tell me. Okay, anyway, so it seems like their shoot that they were planning, which like doesn't make sense anyway and is confusing me, uh, and now it's turned into this survival story, which is fine, but it makes me more excited to read um, episode 13 next month because I really want something that feels like a documentary crew and like a ghost recording and investigation. And that's not, I think, what this is turning out to be. Um, I'm just confused about like how this shoot was gonna work. They just seem to be running around with cameras and like filming random things. It seems like the way that you would film like one of those Planet Earth movies where it's just like you film all these clips and get everything that you can and then afterwards someone's gonna like voice over it and explain things. But with the type of thing that they're trying to create and the way that they wanna like save their careers and make something incredible, I feel like they should be having meetings and planning sessions and like a shot list and have things organized and be talking about what they're shooting and why rather than him being like pulling out the camera filming a clip and the other guy's like you can't film that that's not appropriate because <laughs> there's like a literal child who's in danger and he's like i gotta capture everything and it's like what do you mean though like what are you actually capturing what is your plan shocking that i want a horror book to be more organized that really is my brand. Anyway, I'm gonna read more today. We're gonna head out and do some shopping, and that's the plan. Here's all we got so far. It's very exciting. You're really bright. Progress report halfway through the store. Is that it? Yeah, they ain't gonna fit in there, Why are they so tall? It fits. We did it. Barely. All right, I've been home for about a day now. We've built one of the shelving things. Check it out. Very cool. It opens like this. So it's for shoes, but I'm gonna use one for like hats, one for scarves. On top of it, you might notice a couple of my thrifted finds. I got it, which is very cool because I'm collecting all of these additions. When I can find them, they're hard to find. And I finally found it. And then I grabbed Stay Awake because this is one of those newer thriller releases that I was like interested in enough, not enough to buy, not even enough to buy on sale. But so Valley Village had it for four, I think it was $4. I stopped at, I think, four Value Villages. Half the books, I don't know where they went. I must have left them in the vehicle. I'm about to take Liam to baseball, so hopefully I find them in there. I also cannot find Road of Bones. I brought it in the house because I was reading it last night. I got to two thirds of the way through, and I don't know where I put it, <laughs> which is fine um, because I actually think I'm gonna DNF it, and I don't do this very often, at least within a vlog, once I have already established that I'm going to definitely be reading something. I wouldn't call it boring because things are constantly happening. I just do not care. I truly 
don't care. And I couldn't figure out what it was, if it was because I was on a trip and I just didn't find moments to pick it up, which is totally fine. So then I put on the audiobook on the drive for a bit. I did not like the audiobook enough to listen to it instead of reading it. Because at this point in my life, it's just like if the audiobook isn't better than the physical book, I don't really want to listen to it. Then I got home, picked it up, put in another like 70 pages. There's some interesting concepts in here. We have a main character who is dealing with grief and his sister died when they were children and he has been waiting his entire life for her to contact him because he's been told about ghosts his whole life but he's never really had a supernatural encounter but everybody who has is so passionate about it and he has to believe that to go on because he wants to believe his sister would reach out to him because he also has some guilt associated with her death and I think that's really the only element that I would keep reading to know if he gets to talk to her by the end so I'll probably just skim a little bit and see what happens because I have an inkling of how that's going to all tie up and I just don't care enough about these characters. I don't think the book has given me enough evidence of why I'm supposed to care about these characters other than them being human beings who are going through horrific circumstances. Like they're just fictional characters who like I've been given no reason to think about to care about. I don't put them down the book and think about anything that's gone on. There's an interesting element I would say regarding um feeling sick around the dead. I think that's interesting when you drive over, you know, a certain area, the ghosts make you feel ill and maybe that's how you know that you're entering a paranormal environment. That hasn't really come up anymore. It's really just been scenes of traveling, someone gets injured, traveling, uh, driving, being cold, someone gets hurt, someone gets scared, moving over here, traveling over here. It's just like, what actually is the plot and why should I want to keep reading? It's definitely not making me feel the way a horror book should, that I want a horror book make me feel. I'm not unsettled. I'm not scared. Besides, sure, the actual concept of like, these horrific deaths that have occurred. Since it's based on history, I definitely feel not great about DNFing it because I should witness the discussions involved. I do need to find the book to read the blurbs so hopefully I find it on my way out the door and then I'll update you quickly in the car. Do I need to talk this much more thoroughly about why I'm DNFing something? I don't know. Okay I figured out where the other books were and they were Not a Happy Family by Sherry Lapina which I did not own but I think I thought I did. I also grabbed The Kind Worth Saving which is one I wasn't planning on reading, but then everybody really liked it. It's a sequel to The Kind Worth Killing. And again, for a couple dollars, couldn't say no. And then I found The Wolf and the Woodsman, which I might regret buying it, like if I don't like it, but I figured if I end up loving it, then I'm gonna regret that I left it at Value Village. Um, also, the one that from the library is a hardcover, so like I prefer to read the paperback if I have the option. And then I just grabbed this. <laughs> which I have no justification for, except it's lime green, which is really just my taste right now. Um, and it has a rabbit on the cover. And it says it's a bed and breakfast mystery, so it seems like kind of a cozy. Then I found a lot of bones. So uh, who do we care about? We care about Stephen Graham Jones, who said, the road is long, the night is cold, and there's terror at every pullout. Nothing but dread between. Just try and put this book down, I dare you. Oh my God. Stephen Graham just literally dared me to put the book down and then I did. What I'll say about that is yes, it is action packed. There's always something going on. I get that. I also think that this is like for fans of Stephen Graham Jones, his like nature human mix of horror. This is very much that vibe. Somebody just pulled in the parking lot right in front of me. So I'm going to pretend I'm not talking to myself. Paul Tremblay though. I don't know that this really, oh my. How come everyone is suddenly in the parking lot? I wouldn't say this matches up with the other Paul Tremblay that I have loved. Road of Bones is unrelenting and will chill you to your very core. Sure. Did all these horror authors really love this? Like maybe we were in a bit of a drought for this like just pure action, um, wild ride. It just wasn't my perfect type of horror, which is fine. Progress report on these. There are now two out of three built. I'm not gonna pretend I contributed in any way besides enthusiastic support. I was just thinking I can test my question of like when the paperback comes out or other editions come out or whatever, are there more blurbs? Are there different blurbs? And I have two of these copies now so I can compare. The paperback came out like a year after the hardcover. The top is still featuring Samantha Shannon. We've still got Alexi e. Harrow, S.H. Akrabordi, Kendara Blake, Genevieve Gornachek, 
I think the paperback has two extra people, Tasha Suri and Katherine Addison. So more people do get added. At least nobody like got removed. <laughs> so there we go. If I end up giving it four or five stars, we actually are moving a couple people up the list. So this is The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed. I'm a third of the way in at this point. And my favorite thing about it has been something that was revealed in the synopsis, which I didn't read, and I just loved being caught off guard by that. Unless there's some shape-shifting to come, which is definitely possible, um, here's what how I would describe the book. It's not about a wolf and a woodsman. It's about a girl, she like wears a cloak of um, wolf skin, as do a lot of people in her village. Her village is full of people with magic. Everyone has these different magical abilities. And then there are these group of woodsmen who come and they take a girl from the village and they deliver her to the king every, I can't even remember, every year, every season, something like that. So they're used to people constantly leaving the village. Our main character, uh, Eva K, I think is how you pronounce it. She ends up being like sacrificed and she's the only woman in the village who doesn't have power, but they're gonna pretend that she has power so the woodsmen will take her to the king. They also don't really know what happens to the women who are taken to the king. I guess it's assumed he's killing them or eating them or they become servants or whatever. So Eva K is interested in knowing what happens to the women who go. So that's kind of her investigation at this point. She kind of makes a deal with one of the woodsmen and they end up becoming like a thing. It's definitely an enemies to lovers, questionable um, relationship dynamics, but there are some things to be revealed um, that make it like better. I'm glad it established her age right away. She's apparently 25. She reads like 17. So I would have definitely read her as around that age if it didn't tell me. I do believe uh, I read a long time ago, this was originally written as a young adult or like submitted as a young adult and then got aged up to adult. And I can see why. Um, there is like a lot of body horror in here that leans adult. Um, the magic system is super interesting. It has to do with like self-harm. There's a lot of religious and political implication in here. And I'm sure that's gonna become more so as the relationship develops between these two and they decide they have a common goal. The fairy tale vibes are definitely here. There's a lot of like fables that have been woven and cautionary tales by the powers that be to help people you know, stay in line essentially. So far I like it more than I was liking Juniper and Thorn. I don't think the writing is is really where I need it to be, but I'm interested in the story itself. So we'll see how it goes in, in the next third. This is gonna be a super brief update because I really don't know how I'm feeling about this book, but I said I would check in with you at another third. And um, I just, I don't know what I think of this anymore. So I really just need to read the last chunk because I think the first third was intriguing enough learning. I love learning about the magic in the world and starting this romantic kind of tension. And it took place in the woods and I was liking it a lot. This third uh, was in the, the kingdom, essentially. We're meeting all these new characters. We're establishing all of these dynamics within all of these families and getting all the political intrigue, which I want to be liking but I don't know how to explain it because I think that Ava Reed is doing a fine job of explaining what she needs to explain, but it seems to me like she knows this world so much better than me and I'm only being let in on a little bit of it when this should be an entire series. Like this is just some epic fantasy like with all of these families and clearly so much history that learning about all of it in that small of a time chunk it was like I didn't learn enough but I also learned too much and it was such a slog and I don't know that the goal of the first chunk which I understood and was enjoying now that there's a new goal I don't think it's as interesting. Alexi Harrow said it was gorgeously written and grimly real. And Genevieve Gornacek 
said, Reed has crafted a story that is not only relevant for our times, but has timelessness about it that truly makes it shine. So, okay, I don't disagree that it has some beautiful writing. I think it should have been written in third person if it was gonna have this beautiful writing, because then you could have had like a narrator type character who was using all of this language there's a plane and all of these metaphors it seemed more authentic um, because the character that we come to understand hold on character we meet and how we understand her to be and the education and the life that she has and even the language that she uses within dialogue it just doesn't match up to the narrating voice and language so that definitely took me out of it at times um i do think that if you look at the other books that these authors blurbed yet again i'm gonna say the same thing it totally makes sense i think it checks out with the atmosphere with the writing style with the reality meets fantasy and the fairy tale vibe of it all i don't disagree with the blurbs but i do disagree with enjoying the book as much as the authors did who enjoyed my other favorite things if you're enjoying the lead up to this epic battle it only ends up being one page. If you're enjoying this built up tension waiting for a climax in this relationship, it's only one page. And the entire religious conflict that so much is based around, it gets, you know, solved in the epilogue. So it just didn't exactly sit where I wanted it to sit, which is something that I say in a lot of books. The focus wasn't exactly where I expected or what I came to enjoy wasn't what was a bigger part of the book as much as I would have liked it to be. All in all, I think I'm gonna give it a three. I think I will try one more Ava read because I know she has something coming out soon-ish, but that's it for this one. I was just not in the mood to pick up my camera yesterday, but then I ended up finishing an entire book. So I feel a little guilty about not checking in with you about Reluctant Immortals, but I am done it. And I think the whole time it was just feeling like a three star. So I didn't feel particularly inspired to pick up the camera when I already wasn't feeling like being on camera. You know what I mean? This is one of those cases where the first chapter, actually the first two chapters of this was so incredibly compelling. It set up these characters, Lucy from Dracula and Bertha known as B in here from Jane Eyre and puts them in a different environment. The setup was their friendship, them spending time together, seeing the type of life that they're living. And then there was this ominous, dread creeping in because they're still being followed by these men. I think I picked up these two books at like the same time last year and I'm really into the idea of adult books that feature characters from classics, from fairy tales, and we see them in like more of a modern setting. I thought this would be like my new thing because there's so many YA books out there that are fairy tale related that I, I'm not feeling pulled to and I wanted some adult ones and now they've both been like three stars so I'm not sure where I'm at on this genre or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I would give it like a 3.5. I think it really had an intention and it followed through with that and it did it well. It talked about women and autonomy and like storytelling and how these men and their stories were told and how they didn't get the respect that they desire as like side characters. These women are both immortal and it's talking about what makes a monster if they are inherently monsters because they were created by monsters. It's about feeling trapped. It's about making a life for yourself. It's about female empowerment and friendship and it's all there. It's just a little too heavy handed at the end of the day. It hammered home the same thing so many times. Once we got to the halfway point, there was some interesting like traveling to different locations. They're trying to track down um, different people. I don't want to spoil too much, but there are other characters from their original stories that make their way into this novel. It's set in like the 60s, 70s. There's also references to like a, a cult, um, some other people from history but then it got so much just like escaping the clutches of these bad men constantly on the run being entrapped having to evade them getting trapped again even though it was empowering it ended up being a little bit dull i think it should have been a novella like once i got to especially three quarters of the way in and something specific happened here. And there were some really interesting conversations again about being pulled into this world and sucked back into things. Um, Lucy is bringing Dracula around with her. She's put him in his ashes into different bases and she needs to protect him. Like she has to keep him close 
even while trying to stay away from his influence and not letting him become like put back together. So he's constantly on her mind. Like it's, it's an obsession. And it was so interesting the way it introduced like kind of romance tropes almost. Things that they were saying to each other felt like in another context this would be a romance novel about a woman who is just so obsessed with this man but it turns out to be like a good thing even though you as the reader see it as being kind of problematic. Him being so compelling and just constantly reeling her back in even if it's just mentally and then Rochester also following B around and the abuse that they have suffered and the way that these cycles just like pull you back in. It was saying such interesting things and then it should have ended. So it's tough to rate it and talk about the blurb because like it was a good book. I, I see how it was a good book for people and it did nothing wrong but it just was a little simplistic at the end of the day. So he said this book will sink its teeth into you. And of course what he said on the back with the longer blurb it's just so Stephen Graham Jones to not do things the conventional way when he's interviewed. He's not just going to answer your question. He's going to tell a story. When he writes a blurb he's not just going to say I like this book. He's going to say this is a black rose petal crushed for generations in a moldering Victorian novel, one that's now steadily trickling blood down the spine, those drops collecting not in a cupped palm but the sharp corners of a mouth. Here's what I know about Stephen Graham Jones is he's just a fan of work. You know, um, I see him and his view on speculative stuff the same way I look at Roxane Gay and her thoughts and her opinion on just like media and general fiction. They are just such fans of authors and of books that they're gonna read anything. And Stephen Graham Jones, I guarantee if I went to my shelf right now, I could pull a one star, two star, three, four, and five star, and he will be on every single one of them. So I do agree that these ones that he blurbed, The Murders of Molly Southbourne, and This Thing Between Us, and The Paul Bearers Club, and The Book of the Most Precious Substance, ones that you could argue don't really feel like horror, and they're in this weird genre, like this is perfect for Stephen Graham Jones. And it's the exact thing you expect him to blurb. And yes, I love these so much and they fit into my like weird favorite niche genre. But I really think he blurbs anything and everything and he's just a fan. Uh, and I don't need to pick things up based on his endorsement because like I'm a Stephen Graham Jones girl. I don't need to read the books that he loves because I just love, I love his books. He is for me. I think one could say statistically he's my favorite author. Uh, since I've been reading him since like 2017, when I randomly was buying a book off of my friend Wheezy's um, Amazon wish list, and I just decided to pick this one up for myself at the same time so we could both read it. I have been just a fan. This one just wasn't the biggest win, and that's okay. And now I've moved on to The World Gives Way by Marisa Levian. I'm 50 pages in. I don't know how I feel about it so far. I'm a little bit weary of where the storyline is gonna go, honestly. Um, but right now we have met our main character, whose name I forgot for some reason, Mira. And I don't know, there seems to be a lot of perspectives, which I like because we just got one from Tobias, um, who seems to be like in this world on this spacecraft, like a police kind of man who's going to track her down um, because Mira was enslaved essentially, um, signed up for servitude by um, a, her grandmother and it's been passed down to her and she now has to be a servant to this family. Um, she, she gets owned by different people throughout her life and at the beginning of the book she has the opportunity to escape and make a life for herself and now she's responsible. Let me check the synopsis to make sure I'm not going to spoil anything. She is responsible um, for a small child. I really want to look at the Goodreads. I want to see what other people have been thinking. Um, if the story is going to go where I feel like it is, which is like kind of romance vibes, which I don't know how I feel about between these characters. Skimming through though, it seems like there are other perspectives. And there was one chapter not talking about a specific person, but just giving like a history and a little insight into the world that they live in, which is this spaceship. I don't want to go on the Goodreads because I've heard that this has a great twist and I need to just get back into it right away so I don't stop and think about what the twist could be because in a sci-fi scenario there there are a couple things that come to mind that I don't even want to think about. I'm currently doing some reading sprints with my channel members and hopefully I'll get a good, I don't know, I'm not setting a, a goal for how many pages to get through, but a good chunk and then I can let you know how things are going. Oh, and before I go, I just got a package in the mail and I want to open it. And also, 
a little side note is when I picked this up and showed it to you from the library, um, I didn't realize Alexi Harrow has a blurb right on the front cover. So I think I'm gonna commit to you if the world gives way, isn't a four, a high four or five star. I'm gonna read one more book in this video and that's gonna be Lily Mandelo. And this, if it is what I think it is, I'm gonna try really hard not to let it impact my TBR. I'm not gonna read it right now, but I am gonna see if there's any blurbs on it because wouldn't that be interesting? So thank you so much to Penguin for sending me Rouge by Mono Awad. Are there any blurbs on here? Probably not because it's an R. No blurbs. This isn't gonna distract me. Um, how stunning. I've made it to the halfway point. I'm having a good time with this. I think the world building is really thorough. Um, what I thought when I was glancing through it, what was like other perspectives outside of the two main characters, that's not what these are. These are just like cities and we get to learn about them through this kind of omniscient um, narrator. The whole thing is in third person, but it's interesting how um, the perspectives are written because sometimes I feel like we know more than that character should know, or basically all of their assumptions just land. So the story is this like chase. It's a kind of crime thriller in space where we are following, like we know why the death occurred, but we are also reading from a guy who's trying to figure out and put all these pieces together. And so he's chasing Mira around while she goes and stays in all these different places and tries to evade um, these captors, but she's not also not like trying that hard. <laughs> like she's making a lot of mistakes um, and Tobias is trying to track her down. And every time he sees her, he'll say something like, he's just getting a vibe from her that she is innocent, even though everything is leading towards her looking guilty. So before they like interact or have a conversation and he learns what happened, he looks at her and he's like, she looks like she knows something that other people don't. Like she's looking around as if she's worried for all of these people and she knows that something bad's gonna happen to all of them. And I'm like, what do you mean? She like looks like that. Like, yeah, that is what's going on. And us as the reader know that's what's going on, but I just, I'm not understanding the thought process that some of these characters are going through. And I just need it to be a little more descriptive. Like, what do you mean? That's just the way she looks. I like the writing, all the class systems are set up well, all of the dynamics, all the world building. I think it's good. I'm just wondering where the plot's gonna go. And I'll make sure to film myself reading the last like 50 pages maybe, in case the twist is something that I, I wanna comment on right away. <laughs> What? I'm so confused. <laughs> what was supposed to be the big reveal? In a world on the brink of collapse, a young woman born into servitude must seize her own destiny in this glittering debut with an unforgettable twist. What twist? Okay, upon looking at some reviews and actually reading the synopsis to completion, I think I understand what has happened and I need to actually edit this a little bit differently um, because I've been talking about something throughout this entire book that's revealed in like the first chapter or the first couple chapters and is the reason why she is now free of her servitude and responsible for this baby. But I guess that is like a secret. And so when people talk about there's the, this big secret, I'm not supposed to be talking about what that secret is. And when it says it's an unforgettable twist, I think it means like, it's not your typical sci-fi. It's got a twist. The twist is there's a secret that she only knows. And she is now doing all of these things to like, keep the secret, share the secret. I don't know. I can see how people would find this a really beautiful story. And I would recommend it to people generally, I think. I would recommend it alongside like some other YA sci-fi um, that I also gave three stars. If you are exclusively like an adult hard sci-fi kind of person, I don't think this is something that I would recommend because it feels like a lot of the YA books that I've read and also the science is very much like, it just works that way because it does. And a lot of it to me doesn't even feel sci-fi because the whole intent of this ship is that it's a recreation of Earth basically. So like there is a fake 
sky and sun and it's cities and there's a desert and there's cars and it's like they feel like they are on earth they are on a planet i think tons of people will appreciate the journey this main character goes on um finding her way out of servitude the relationships that she creates and the kind of found family of it all i don't know that it had as much commentary as i was expecting regarding that and also following like a cop essentially a cop like figure who is kind of finding out that other cops are corrupt and like maybe people shouldn't be in servitude and shouldn't belong to other people. I honestly thought there was gonna be a far bigger reveal regarding something else. It was engaging, it didn't do a lot for me. So yeah, three, 3.25. Hannah Witten said it's infinite in scope yet intimately told. It's a meditation on justice, morality, and the power of connection, both in the face of crisis and in the everyday mundane. A stunning debut from an author to watch. I think I would read more from her. Um, it's got apocalyptic, dystopian vibes. So there's lots of, of my favorite keywords that I probably would have picked this up at some point outside of this video anyway. But yeah, Hannah Winton's not moving anywhere on the spreadsheet. And I think, I don't know, should I read one more? Because it's such a short book and like I'm gonna read it this month anyway. And since Alex E. Harrow is one of the only um, authors who who moved up in this video, I think I'll just run through this and give you like a quick review because it's only, you know, 100 pages. And hopefully it doesn't flop because that would not be a good way to end it. It would turn out that my favorite book of the entire video is the one that wasn't even on my TBR originally. Uh, so this is gonna be like a 4.25. Uh, here's the final update on these. I did help build one of them. There's another one at the bottom of the stairs. They all fit but didn't look good down there together. So two of them I have up here and it's gonna be a great place for my toot collection because I have far too many of them. Here are my five favorites. This one, <laughs> this one for obvious reasons. Hockey's been rough to watch this week. Maybe this one or this one or this one. Yeah, I think that's the one. Anyway, so this is about a woman um, and she is doing this research. She has this job and um, the science of it all is sharing consciousness with a wolf. It's pretty large scope, but it's also only 100 pages. So it's just my type of thing. It's like our wives under the sea meets, once there were wolves, meets like marriage story. We've got two women who are married and their relationship is in a lot of turmoil because of our main character, Sean's obsession with these wolves and everything she's willing to do and willing to abandon in the rest of her life to commit uh, to this like scientific research. I typically love stories of obsession and I also love slice of life and just reading them like arguing <laughs> essentially for half of this book is probably not going to appeal to a lot of people but I just think it's really interesting being with them for the short period of time at this state in their marriage where they have to make a decision if they want to continue on together um, and what that looks like and what they would have to like sacrifice essentially. And it's also this kind of just big metaphor for escapism um, her wanting to kind of live as a wolf you know gives the same vibes as night bitch but it's not quite as weird like the scientific concepts are definitely weird but the story itself feels weirdly rooted in reality and it is about this marriage and life decisions um i just had a really good time with it i think at the end of the day you know i didn't have a new five star favorite these are the ones that i finished and they go anywhere from three to four and a half stars so i think what i can trust from blurbs is that i'm never gonna hate the books like if an author who's endorsed other things that i've loved endorses something i'm probably not going to hate it it's not going to be poorly written it's not going to not make sense um it is well edited enough and with a publisher and from an author who like obviously has the team involved that has got it in the hands of someone else on the same trajectory so blurbs from well-established authors should generally mean that the books are at least decent. <laughs> but for me, the thing that a blurb does at the end of all of this is number one, it gives me a vibe for what the book is going to be. Obviously we're talking about different genres here with all of these authors, but we are in the weird kind of speculative space. So the fact that Alex E. Harrow is the one on here and not Paul Tremblay or Stephen Graham Jones 
tells me before I pick this up, it's going to be more whimsical in nature rather than straight up horror, though this is marketed as like science fiction fantasy horror. I think I will continue on in the life that I've been living up until now that I barely pay attention to blurbs. It's never going to make me pick up a book outside of like video content um, that I wasn't already interested in just because somebody's name is on the cover because I don't think blurbs can be trusted some of the time. I would rather look up a list or an interview from an author, look at their social media where they literally say like, here's a list of my favorite books. Because I don't think an author blurbing something necessarily means they really loved it. It's that they are endorsing it for others for whatever reason. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, let me know if you're planning on picking any of these up now or if I've dissuaded you from that. Oh, so I'm like the opposite of a book blurber. I am unendorsing books. Okay, uh, I'll see you later. Thank you so much for being here, bye.